Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning as we come together to worship our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Announcements here for us, our lay servant ministry certification course. The schedule is in our bulletin, so uh, feel free to go over uh, the schedule there. We do have our links where we can go in and sign up for these courses. That link has been emailed to everybody if you're interested and you haven't received that link, please either let me know or Jeremy know and we'll send those links over to you. And uh, the Salmon Festival in here, the Hmongs, yes, they did volunteer that they were going to uh, take over the Salmon Festival, but we found out that uh, it was too late. And so this year, uh, our spot has been given to someone else and then we'll, we'll do the Salmon Festival again next year. So. Uh, there will be no summer festival for us this year. Is that correct, Brandy? Okay, so just to make sure we all understand that. So this year we will not be doing the Salmon Festival. And then the malls yesterday also wanted me to let everybody know that uh, we haven't done the rummage sales for, for a while. And so they are interested in helping out with that or running that if whoever is the one that was in charge of that. I forgot. I forget who was in charge of the rummage sale. So um, they are in, interested in that. If you would like to talk to them, uh, you can. And so they're open to either running that or helping out with it, okay? So those are my announcements for today. Any other announcements? Just the normal one from me. Um, there's always room on the pages for signups, and I am just so pleased you guys have been so great, and I appreciate that. It's, it's nice to be able to go out there and have a glass of punch and a chat for a while, so thank you. And to have somebody coming early and putting their hand out there and saying, welcome. That's pretty wonderful. So thank you. Thank you, Alma. Anyone else? And just let us know, I will be on vacation for the next two Sundays. And so next week, Pastor Neil, some of you probably know who Pastor Neil is. I believe he used to pastor the Paradise Church, but he is in Chico right now. He is a retired pastor. And so he'll be here to uh, do communion and to lead the worship service Next Sunday, it will be a combined worship service. And so, and then the following week, uh, on the 11th, uh, Gail will be the one to give us the lesson, the sermon lesson, okay, on the, on the 11th for our uh, English service. And then Tommy and Tracy will be doing the Hmong service on the 11th. So just let all of us know that. And so if, if there's no more announcement, please stand with me and join me for the call to worship. This is a prayer to the Holy Spirit from the United Methodist Hymnal book, page uh, 329. O great spirit, whose breath gives life to the world and whose voice is heard in the soft breeze. Make us wise so that we may understand what you have taught us. Make us always ready to come to you with clean hands and steady eyes. Our spirits may come to you. Amen. Please turn your hymns to 168, page 168, at the name of Jesus.
Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful morning. We thank you for just guiding us and just being with us, protecting us and watching over us, Lord. We thank you for this special time as we come before you to worship you, to spend this time with you. May your grace rain down upon each and every single one of us, opening up our eyes to who you are, transforming our hearts to being like your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. Let us know and let us stand in knowing that Jesus Christ is the Savior, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Chosen One to save this world, to die upon that cross, to restore us into the relationship with you, our Father. And so we ask for your presence to be here with us. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated at this time. It's time for our Old Testament reading. The Old Testament reading this morning is Daniel 2, 44 to 45. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to other, another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will in- itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. The word of God for the people of God. Please stand with me if you're able to. And turn your hymns to page 157. 157, Jesus shall reign. Praise our Lord. You may be seated at this time. It's time for us to share our joys and concerns. Well, Jolene, I'll do it. Yeah, Ellen and Keith haven't arrived yet, and so we're kind of worried. Jolene called, and nobody answered. Okay. 
Okay, good, then we won't worry about them. <laughs> but we can have prayers for them, just because we're missing them. Anyone else? Okay, let us pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for your blessings upon our lives. We thank you so much for giving us a heart to care for one another. We thank you so much for each other. Even today as Keith and Ellen are in Willows, we ask that you be with them and bless them. At this time, Lord, just bless them during this time. Also be with us as we come here together before you to come and worship you, Lord. Let us know who your son Jesus Christ is as today we reflect upon this very, very question. As Jesus Christ took his disciples into the region of Caesarea Philippi to ask them, in the midst of a culture that was forever changing at that time also, in the midst of a culture of many different ideas, philosophies, religions, and yet it is in this midst in which Jesus Christ challenged his disciples to give him an answer as to who he is and as to who they believe he was to be. And so let us reflect upon these things today, even in the midst of our own culture or in our own time, Lord. In a time that's forever changing also, Lord. Let us know who your son Jesus Christ is, for this is the foundation of our church, the foundation of all things that we do. Continue to bless our church, continue to shine upon us, pouring down your grace from heaven to each and every single one of us, allowing us to be the light, the light that you have called us to be. In this world that is filled with much, much darkness, continue to allow us to love one another and care for each other as we are already doing, but continue to encourage us in doing these things for each other, Lord. We pray for the United Methodist Church for the entire denomination as we go through this difficult time here. We pray for all the churches throughout this entire globe, the one universal church, the invisible church, where all of our brothers and sisters who are gathering here across the globe here today to come together to worship you, Lord. May their time of worship be a time to build them up in their faith. May it be a time of encouragement, a time in which brings much, much glory to you, Lord. Even our brothers and sisters in countries and in nations that are that doesn't allow them to worship you, that doesn't have the freedom of religion, Lord, we ask that you bless them. We ask that your grace be upon each and every single one of them, protecting them during these difficult, difficult times, Lord. We also pray for our nation that you continue to watch over us, that you continue to bless us, continue to bless our president, bless our Congress, bless, bless all of our political leaders, bless all of our religious leaders, Bless everybody in this nation that we know who you are, that we'll continue in our faith, that we'll continue to remember the grace that you've poured upon us that throughout these years, that throughout our history, Lord, you've always been there with us every, every step of the way. So let us not forget these things, Lord. And let us pray the prayer that your son Jesus Christ once taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom comes, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The New Testament reading is Matthew 16, 13 through 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. 
And I tell you that you are Peter, and on the rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. The word of God for the people of God. Well, there are many questions that are often asked of us in this life. I think the very first question, when I think about it, when I think the very first question that is asked of us in this life is when we are conceived in our mother's womb. People will often ask, well, is that a boy or a girl, right? But sometimes even this is being taken away from us nowadays because um, a lot of times there's a movement to declare that we can't, you know, we can't really declare anyone to be a boy or a girl anymore until, until they identify themselves. And so that, but that's one of the very, you know, that's one of the very first question that is often asked about us when we're conceived. And then when we were born, the question that is often asked of us when we're born is, well, how many pounds did that baby weigh? How big was that baby? And then throughout life, I think um, another question that is often asked of us, because many of us, you know, I know in the, at least in the Hmong culture, we used to get married young, and nowadays we, we, we no longer follow that tradition anymore, but, you know, being that we don't follow that tradition anymore, many of the, the um, kids nowadays, they wait until they're, they're older in age to get married. But one of the questions that often, that our parents often ask us, or just people in general often ask us when we don't get married is, when will you get married, right? <laughs> when will you get married, or who will you marry? And then, of course, there's so many questions that we often also have to ask ourselves in life, too. And these questions are questions such as, what are the beliefs? What are my beliefs? Or what are the values of my life? And where do I see myself also in five to ten years from now? I was talking to one of the youth in um, Marysville last week, and I asked him this very same question. You know, where, where do you see yourself five to ten years from now? And he said, Pastor, I don't, I don't think about that. I just think about making money today. I don't think about five or ten years down the road. I said, no, we've got to sit down. We've got to think about that because you're... You know, you're, you're in your, you're, you're in your you know, 20s now, and your parents are no longer here with you, and so we have to sit down and think about that, because I want you to get ahead in life, too. And so uh, that's one of the conversations I had with one of our single adults in Marysville just last week. And then, of course, we also have to ask ourselves, have I surrounded myself with the right people for me, right? Our friends often determines how our life turns out. If we have friends who are there to support us, I mean, it makes, it makes life so much more easier. But if we have friends who are, they're not, who are not there to support us, or if we have friends who pull us towards a certain lifestyle, that, that may be a challenge for us. And so we have to ask ourselves that. You know, do I have the right people um, with me? Do I have the people that will support me? Or do I have the people that will build me up, that would encourage me, that will exalt me during times of uh, difficulties, right? And during times in which I need that support. And then another question that we need to ask ourselves is how have I contributed to the life of others? We've been talking about just being generous, right? Being generous with our lives uh, and helping other people and loving other people. So how have we contributed to the life of other people? But I believe that the most important question that we are to answer is this very question here in verse 15. In verse 15 here in Matthew chapter 16, in which Jesus also presented to his disciples. And Jesus said to them, who do you say that I am? And this question is so important for us because it determines our eternity. It does more for us than what many times we, we think, right? Many times we, we, we may forget exactly how important this question is because who we believe in Christ is not, deter, not only determines our life, not only determines what we do, but it also determines our eternity, where we are going to go. You know, this morning, I woke up around 6.30, and after I got ready to come to church, I decided to take a little nap, and when I took a, a little nap, I had a dream of my father, of heaven, and Jesus took me to heaven and showed me where my father was at, right? He was in heaven, in paradise. So this question is a question that is so important for us. I, don't, I believe that there is no other question that is more important than this question for us in our lives because it determines more than just our life here on earth, but it determines our eternity. 
our eternity. And so who do we say Jesus Christ is in our lives? You see, as we go through the UMC split, there's a lot of accusations. There's a lot of mudslingings against each other. And often, you know, it happens all the time whenever there's issues, whenever there's disagreements, whenever there's schism in the church. And it's not, it's not anything new. It's not anything new, right? It's happened throughout Christian history from the time in which the, the Roman Catholic Church split from the Eastern Orthodox Church and around the, the year 1000 to the time in which the Martin Luther and the Reformation took place. We have that schism from the Protestants and, um, and um, the Roman Catholics. And at a time in which the, which the Methodists you know, started building up the Methodist Church and, and we split from the Anglican Church. And so this is not anything new. This is not anything new. It's something that's part of our history, part of the Christianity. It's, it's part of our history. But I think the more important thing for us to really constantly having to ask ourselves is this, what is the foundation of our faith? What is the foundation of our faith? Because we really have to come down to that. Because these are questions that I find myself always just reflecting upon. And these, there, there, there are five things. And the first thing is what uh, theologians call Christology. Now, Christology, that is who is Jesus Christ? You know, with all the things, all the distractions that are going on around you, there's always going to be distraction, you know, in life. There's always going to be distraction. There's always going to be people arguing with each other, right? Are we going to allow that to affect us? Are we going to allow that to affect our faith, you know? Where are we going to stand in our faith, right? To me, you know, it doesn't matter what anybody else does. All that really matters to me, it really comes down to these five things, is who is Jesus Christ? The first thing is, who is Jesus Christ in my life? Is he simply just, is just a religious leader, or is he who he claims to be? And then the second question that I often ask myself really comes down to the authority of the Scripture. We call that bibliology. What is the authority of Scriptures in my life? Is it simply a writing of the experience of the apostles, of the prophets? Or does the scripture contain the word of God himself? What is the scripture? What is the authority of the scripture in my life? The third question is pneumatology. That's in reference to the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? How do I discern the voice of the Holy Spirit? Do I discern the voice of the Spirit through the Scripture? Or do I discern the voice of the Holy Spirit simply through human experience? Where do I stand in my faith when it comes to this? The fourth question is ecclesiology, about the church. What is the main mission of the church? Are we here to declare it and to proclaim the message of the gospel, or are we simply here as a nonprofit group to do good works in the community? Are we here for political and social activism, or is our main mission to declare the message of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to every nation? And then the fifth and final question, of course, comes down to theology. How does all of this fit together in my faith? How do I bring all of this historically, scripturally, how do I bring all of this together and fit together in my own faith? And so these are questions that I often reflect upon. And I hope that by just pointing out these questions that you will also take these questions and reflect upon these questions yourself. First thing is, who is Jesus Christ? Second thing is, what is the authority of scripture? The third thing is, who is the Holy Spirit? How do I discern his voice? The fourth thing is, what is the mission of the church? What is the purpose of the church? And the, third, the last thing is, how does all of this fit together in your own personal walk, in your own religion, in your own faith in Jesus Christ? And so today, I'm just going to reflect on that very first question. Who is Jesus Christ? You see, it's very important for us to understand, for us to understand Caesarea Philippi. Because there's always a purpose in what Jesus does, right? We talked about that, that there's an intention in everything that the Apostle Paul did. And this is, there's also that same intention in the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. As he took his disciples to this very region here in Caesarea Philippi. Barclay, a theologian, said this about this region. He said, and I quote, The area was scattered with temples of the ancient Baal worship. 
By Caesarea Philippi there rose a great hill in which was a deep cavern, and that cavern was said to be the birthplace of the great Pan, the god of nature. In Caesarea Philippi there was a great temple of white marble built to the godhead of Caesar. It is as if Jesus deliberately set himself against the background of the world's religion and all their history and splendor and end quote. That's what Barclay, the theologian, said about this region here. You see, this region here was a region which many different philosophies and ideas and many different religions came out of this region here in Caesarea Philippi. And so Jesus purposely took his disciples to this place as, as they oversee, as they look over this whole entire region, this place called Caesarea Philippi. And from where they were standing, they could see all the temples. They could see all the pagan worship. They could see all the philosophies of men, all the wisdom of men. And it is in this place in which Jesus stood and Jesus turned back to them. And Jesus gave them this very question, who do you say that I am? As you're, as you're seeing all these things that's going on around you, as you're being distracted by all these things that are going on around you, who do you say that I am? And then in, in our context, we live in a similar context to that because we live in a culture in which there's so many different religions, so many different philosophies, so many f- different ideas. So many different things, so many different things are being said about Jesus Christ nowadays. And so in our own context, in the midst of these many differing views within the context of our own culture, where do we stand as a church? Where do we stand as Christians as to who Jesus Christ is? Because in our world, in our world, there's many different ideas, right? Judaism, they view Jesus Christ as a great teacher. And they even say that Jesus Christ, if we read the writings, they even say that Jesus Christ was a worker of miracles. But yet they say he is not the Messiah. He is not the Messiah. So they're still waiting for the Messiah. In Islam, Islam, they, they actually highly revere Jesus Christ. He's actually, Jesus Christ is actually someone that is very, very important in the Islam faith but they see him as a great prophet, as being in the line of the prophets, ending with Muhammad. And they they say Jesus Christ is not the son of God. And then we see Hinduism. In Hinduism, they worship many different gods. And so they believe that Jesus Christ is another God. He's just one of the many gods they worship. And so who do we, where do we stand, right? And in Jesus' time, we read here in the scripture, <coughs> excuse me, in Jesus' time, we see that the public opinion of Jesus was that Jesus is John the Baptist. Others said Jesus is Elijah, right? Elijah was a miracle worker. So of course, when they see Jesus doing these miracles, they say, Jesus must be Elijah. And Jesus was always talking about, about, um, the kingdom of God too. And so they saw Jesus as one of the old prophets. They saw Jesus as either Jeremiah or one of the old prophets that have, has, have come back to life to preach that message once again. And so the public will always have thoughts of who Jesus Christ is, whether it's back in ancient time during the days of Jesus, during, the, during biblical times, or even today, they will always have an opinion of who Jesus Christ is. But you see, all these opinions and all these ideas of who Jesus Christ is, one thing that is common about them is that they always come short of who Jesus Christ claims himself to be. Our culture nowadays, 92% of America, according to a study made by Barna, 92% of America believes that Jesus Christ was a historical figure, that he was an actual person, right? 92%. And yet, out of that 92%, only 56% believes that Jesus is the Son of God as he proclaimed, as he said that he was. But not only that, the very first American generation, the very first American generation that goes under 50% in believing that Jesus is God are the millennials. The millennials. Yeah. They will, only 48% of millennials believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God as he claims to be. 
And so we see, yeah, we, we see that reflection inside our churches too, right? Nowadays, the millennials, they don't come to church anymore. Most of our churches are filled with older, the older generation because we're losing that. We're losing that, that faith in who Jesus Christ really is. And many people believe that Jesus Christ was a great teacher. Many believe that Jesus Christ was just simply an example for us. Many, many pastors, many pro- more progressive pastors would teach us this. They would, they would say that Jesus' death on the cross was not an atonement for us. Because as we try to take Jesus Christ and as we try to humanize him, right, we try to take him and we try to fit him into human experience, many pastors are starting to teach today that Jesus' death on the cross is not an atonement for us, that he did not take away our sin. But his death on the cross was merely just a moral example for us. They call this the moral um, influence theory, that Jesus' death was simply that, was just to set an example for us so that we can love one another, but it didn't actually take away our sin. And in many cases, in many cases, many are starting to believe today that even Jesus Christ himself was not sinless, that Jesus lived a life in which he had sin. And that's the whole reason why he did not die for us. That's the whole reason why he did not die for our sin, but he simply died to be that moral example for us. Now, these are the things that we're facing with nowadays, right? Part of our Christian history since the late 19th century. I mean, we can go through the whole history, but it's, it's going to be a lot. It's going to take a long time. But since the early 19th century, we've, we've been moving towards these ideas that Jesus Christ here in America, that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. And we're slowly inching towards that as Christians here in America. Western Christianity is moving towards that direction. But who does Jesus Christ claim himself to be? Well, we see in John chapter 8, verse 53. In verse 57 to verse 58, this is what I'm going to read for us here today. And this is Jesus' uh, debate with the Pharisees. And they say, are you greater than our father Abraham who died? And are you greater than the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself to be? So this is the question which the Pharisees are presenting to Jesus Christ at this time. And Jesus answers in verse 57 to verse 58. And Jesus says uh, to the, uh, oh, well, the, the Jews said to him, okay, this is what the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? And so Jesus' response is in verse 58. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So he is claiming the name of God, right? That very name, the name Yahweh. In the Hebrew, it means Yahweh, the name Yahweh. He's claiming God's name. Before Abraham, I was God. That's basically what he's saying. I was already alive. I, you know, I existed before Abraham. I am God. That's what he's saying. When he said that word, those words, I am Yahweh, he's proclaiming the name of, of God. So that's who Jesus Christ claims to be. He claims to be God. He claims to be alive before Abraham. And if we continue to read here in John chapter 8, we will see that the Pharisees were, were the Jews, they, they were angry at that. And they picked up stones and they were going to stone him because of what he said. And in John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. He says, I and the Father are one. He claims to be one with God. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one, see, no one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is saying here that the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. Now, did Jesus lie to us? Do we believe that? Do we believe that what Jesus is saying here is true? Or do we believe, as what the Hindus say, that Jesus is only a way to God, one of the many ways to God? And most, part, most, most of postmodernist Christians believe in this also. We believe that Jesus Christ is only a way to God, and that there's many different ways to God. But Jesus Christ here is saying that, you know, no one goes to the Father, no one goes to God except me. He's claiming he's the only way. 
And so how does this fit into our view today? Our view, I'm talking, when I'm talking about our view, I'm talking about the view of our culture nowadays. How does this fit into the view of our culture nowadays as we, as we become more and more, our emphasis become more and more upon religious pluralism, even in the church, right? Even in the church where our pastors, our seminaries are starting to teach that, you know, it's okay to no longer believe in Jesus Christ. I was, I was taught this in the United Methodist Church Seminary in Claremont, that G, you, no, you no longer need to believe in Jesus Christ to be a Christian, that that was only, that was only the opinion of Paul. So where do we stand? Where do we stand when, when these things are going on around us? Are we going to say, well, Jesus, well, Jesus maybe Jesus was wrong. Jesus was outdated. He lived 2,000 2, years ago, so he was wrong. Or maybe we might say, well, you know, maybe Jesus, maybe he lied to us, right? Maybe Jesus Christ lied to us. Or did Jesus, if he is God, did Jesus tell us the truth? And these are questions that we have to reflect upon. Did Jesus tell us the truth? Is Jesus, is Jesus who he claims to be? Because if he is not who he claims to be, then can he even be a great moral example for us in the first place? In other words, if Jesus lied to us, if Jesus did not know what he was talking about, then can we even argue that now he is a great moral teacher or a great moral example for us? Because if he lied to us, or if he did not know what he was talking about, then of course he cannot be that great moral teacher for us either. You see, many times we try, to, we try so much to just, you know, water everything down, everything down to make Jesus Christ more human. So we say he's a great moral teacher to us, but we don't realize that if we call him a great moral teacher to us, then that means that what he taught us was good, was true. But yet if we, what he taught us was not true, what he taught us was a lie, then he can't be that great moral teacher to us. If Jesus is not who he claims to be, then the conclusion must be that Jesus Christ was the greatest con artist in human history. And all these years of following Jesus Christ, we've been lied to. And he did not know what he was talking about, or he lied to us. And so these are questions that we must reflect upon. Is Jesus Christ who he say he is? And so who do you and I, today, in the midst of our own culture, in the midst of our ch changing times, in the midst in which the United Methodist Church is changing, the American Christian culture is changing, the seminaries are changing. Everything is changing. And you might not feel that at the local level, right? We don't really feel that much at the local level. But if you go out of the local level to the, the, the seminaries and, and the conference and things like that, it's, everything is starting to change. As things are changing, who do we say Jesus is in that mist? Do we dare to say the same thing that Peter once said? When he answered Jesus Christ, he said, you are the Messiah. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That is his answer in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16. And we have to come to understand that if Jesus isn't the Messiah, then every promise and every prophecy that was made in the Old Testament about the Messiah has failed. And that, made, that makes the word of God untrue. So if Jesus Christ is not who he claims to be, then everything in the Old Testament we can do away with because it can no longer be fulfilled. And I'm just going to give us three examples here to, to help us understand. And because in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, it says, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. So that's talking about his, his offspring, his lineage. Until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. So this is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. It's, it's, in other words, it's saying that, that the kingdom, the, the, ruling, the ruling of, the, of Judah and his lineage will not depart until the, Jesus Christ comes, until the Messiah comes. And so the promise is, is that, the, that a descendant of Judah, that a descendant of Judah will always reign until the coming of the Messiah. So that's what that verse is simply telling us here. And we see in 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed. 
The political power was taken away from the Jewish people. And since that time, there have not been any ruler from Judah. And so if we're still waiting for the Messiah, if we're still waiting for the Messiah, then this prophecy is not true. The only way for this, promise, for this prophecy to, is to be true is if the Messiah came before then. If we read the prophecies of Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to verse 27, I'm not going to go over the whole thing for us, but in that prophecy, it gives us the timeline because Daniel has, has been in Babylon for many years, and now he's an old man. He's now, he's now an old man, and, and he's discovered from the writings of the prophets, the older prophets such as Jeremiah and them, that they were going to be in Babylon for 70 years. And after 70 years, they were going to come back and build the temple and build, this, build the walls in the city of Jerusalem. So during this late time in Daniel's life, he received a vision from God, from the angel Gabriel. And it gives him a timeline as to when the Messiah was going to be born. And this timeline, this coincides exactly with the life and birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so if Jesus was not the Messiah, then this prophecy to Daniel would be false. And there's no reason for us to trust in the Old Testament either if Jesus Christ was not the Messiah because that time has already passed. And it coincides exactly with the life and birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 27, it talks about the end of the sacrificial system. When the prophecy was given to Daniel, it talks about the end of the sacrificial system. And after the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, we know that that put an end to the sacrificial system, both spiritually and physically, because the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And so the sacrificial system no longer is being used nowadays. And so if the prophecy of the scripture is wrong, and then we're still waiting for the Messiah. If we're still waiting for the Messiah, if we're still waiting to see who the Messiah is, then this cannot be fulfilled either. And so through these, these, through these um, prophecies, we see that Christ's life coincides with these prophecies. And we also see in Malachi. Malachi teaches us in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, it says that the Lord whom you are seeking, talking about the Messiah, will come to his temple. So when, it, when it's talking about here, what, what it's teaching us here in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, is that Jesus Christ will come at a time in which the temple will still stand. There is no temple today. The temple no longer stands. So why are we still waiting for the Messiah, you see? Because once again, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And so if Jesus is not the Messiah, then there is no one to come. And all the prophecies of the Old Testament, all the words of the Old Testament can be thrown away. There's no reason for us to worship anymore. There's no reason for us to talk about it anymore because what, what is assumed to be what God has taught us in the Old Testament is just not true. So the only way for it to be true is if Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And I can go on and on and on about these prophecies, but I hope we get the point. And that's why Jesus Christ says, it is on this rock I will build my church, and the rock in which Jesus Christ is the Messiah. It is based upon that in which I will build my church, and the gates of Hades cannot overcome it. And so that is the foundation of the church, knowing who Jesus Christ is. Knowing that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. It is only on that in which Satan cannot overcome. It is only on that in which G that Satan cannot destroy. But if we were to build our foundation on anything else, that Satan can easily destroy that. That, for, that foundation would not be firm enough for, for Satan. And Satan can easily get rid of that. And 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 says, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You see, Paul is referring back to what Jesus Christ taught his disciples. Paul is referring back to what Jesus said to his disciples in verse 18 of Matthew chapter 16. He's saying no one can lay a foundation. And he's making a distinction here between gold and silver, human wisdom and things like that, human philosophy, human religion. He's saying we cannot lay any other foundation, not gold, not silver, not human wisdom, not human leaders, not human religions, ideas, and things like that. We cannot lay any other foundation, but the only foundation that, that we can depend on is the foundation that has already been laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so it's, this is how important this question is for us as Christians. That when we come to answer this question, we must know and we must believe 
who Jesus Christ is. If the church is going to stand the test of time, if the church is going to stand in a forever changing culture, we're going to have to know who Jesus Christ is. 2,000 years of Christian history, Christ is still the same. He's still who he is. Nations have risen. Many nations have fallen. But Christ remains who he is. You know, many times we, we get intimidated by the things that are going on around our culture, right? I mean, Christians have struggled with that throughout the entire 2,000 years of Christian history. We've always struggled with what to do with the culture that is around us. We've always struggled with that. But those who keep to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they will survive. They've always survived. And that's the challenge for us today. And I just want to read to us. I know we all know the Apostles' Creed, but this is what we believe in, right? This is what we believe in. This is what Christians have always believed in. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his Holy Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge in the quake and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the, ho the Holy Catholic Church the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. That word Catholic Church there is not re in reference to the Roman Catholic Church. It's, the word Catholic is trans it's translated universal. That's what it means, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The is what we need to say. Okay. Not Catholic. Okay, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's fine. So I want us to understand what that means, okay? So we believe, who, this is who we believe Jesus Christ is. That he is the Son of God. He is our Lord. That he was born of the Virgin Mary. And before 1880 here in America, that's what we all believed in. But since 1880, we've been moving away from that. We've been moving away. Before 1880, we believe in the creeds here in America. Since 1880, we've been moving away from the creeds. And we've been coming up with our own ideas as to who Jesus Christ is. And that's what we face in America. And so we need to come to ask ourselves, who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say that he is? Is he who he claims to be? Or is he not? I know it's so hard, it's so difficult for us sometimes as we face the many challenges of our time. But let us not give up hope. Let us not give up hope on trusting and believing in who our Lord Jesus Christ is. Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for blessing us. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, whom just re revealed himself to us. It's hard, Lord. It's difficult. It's a challenge for us to keep the faith. As we see many things changing around us, as we see many of our children no longer coming to church, as we see the new, new generation as they're drifting away from the faith. And many times this causes us to think that we too need to drift away, that we too need to leave our faith behind. But Lord, give us the heart to know who we are. But more importantly, give us the heart to know who your son Jesus Christ is. And it is only in this in which we built, in which your son Jesus Christ has built his church upon the foundation of who he is. And it is in this that the gates of Hades will not overcome. So we lift everyone here up to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. If you can, please stand with me at this time. Turn your hymnals to page 672. 672. No, that's the wrong, that's the wrong one I have. What? Oh, it's over here. At 545, 545, the church is one foundation.
It's okay. There's one more verse. It's okay. <laughs> no problem. Well, um, I am going to miss all of you, but I'll see you in two weeks, okay? So God bless you until then, and uh, I'm excited for all of you. Pastor Neil will be here next week to be with all of you, so I'm sure he'll do a great job. He's a great pastor, too. So God bless all of you until we meet again.